I told the makeup artist who told the producer and the producer took me to a doctor who just said, I pinched myself, she must go back to work. And that's mm -hmm. what I did. And that feeling of helplessness and, and also just, I still felt like I was disappointing people, like I'm doing something wrong. But they wrong. were gaslighting you. Now Completely. that we, we know the, the, the name, the, the word of what, what was happening to you. You know, fast forward, hospital happens, da, 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 da. And mine was a minor stroke, mm. right? And I'll always think of it as a warning for hmm? the something is off here. Mm. Something is off here. Literally, um, this was a Wednesday. Mm. On Saturday, my husband gets a call. Is Salamina coming back to work on Monday? What are wow. you expecting us to do? Must we write her out? Wow. And I said, I, I'm still in hospital at the time. 702. The upside of failure. Sometimes failure is the foundation of greatest success stories. Friend. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, my word. Why did you call me? It's <laughs> such a serious topic. But it's a Friday. You know, you are one of um, the realest people I know in this industry. And we knew each other from when we were much younger. <laughs> and um, I think even though your story is kind of out there, I think people, there's certain things people would be shocked to find out about you for you to be where you are. Hmm. Like they don't know. <laughs> you know, so it's like, no, this woman needs to come. And your, your story is powerful. I don't... Uh, yeah, okay. Do you do you think your story is powerful? You know, I've been struggling. Mm. Driving here, I was like, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about failing, then succeeding, and failing, yes. then succeeding. But when it feels like you're still very much in the the everydayness of it, yeah. it doesn't feel powerful. Mm. It feels like a struggle. Right? It feels yes. like lifing. It feels like adulting and all of yeah. that. So I guess, you know, when <laughs> your producer reached out, I said yes, knee jerk reaction. It's you, it's Lebo is <laughs> asking me to come <laughs> chill with her in the afternoon. Then I looked at the topic and I was like, okay, upside of failure. Oh. <laughs> okay, we've had these conversations off air. Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to unpack this yes, on a Friday on, afternoon? On air, during <laughs> on the air. people. Yeah. So I think that was really what it is. But yeah, man, it's been a journey. Plus, I feel like I've made you so many pancakes that you, you this is your way of paying me back for the pancakes. <laughs> Look, um, <laughs> <laughs> I I love I love the, the the show. I love the slot. I love the kind of conversations that you've had in the past. Mm. Um, and I think that's also scary. I yeah. think I'm sure you've heard this when people come. The minute I realized, oh, it's time. Yes, I suddenly got nervous. Everybody, I've everybody, been texting back and forth with my husband. And Shem, he's so sweet. His last message to me was, remember who you are. <laughs> so there you go, guys. How as I said, I must remember who I am. So I'm ready. And, and you know, it's so weird. Like, as I'm sitting with you, there's certain memories that are coming back. But what I can tell you, I specifically remember um, when we were starting out, I mean, you had been doing Soul Buddies and I met you at Crazy. Yes. And I was a newbie. But we were both babies yeah. at the time. But I still saw you as like an OG baby <laughs> because there were so many things that you already knew and understood while we were like kids earning like 500 rand a call, 400 rand a call. And I, I just remember thinking because I was still figuring out, you know, I would sometimes sit with the makeup artist, run to be a production assistant, and then they asked me to be in front of camera. But I just remember always being like, Salamina just knows what she's doing. She knows where she's at. Like, I just kept thinking, this person, and then at some, you were at Varsity, and I was like, this woman, <laughs> you know? And I'm wondering, when you were growing up, um, prior to getting into the television space, did you feel like this is the direction or do you almost feel like things were happening to you? 
definitely things were happening to me. I mean, even for my first big job in the industry, Soul Buddies, yeah, that wasn't my audition. It was my brother's audition. I was just there like, as the yeah. cheerleader. And not even. <laughs> and Dr. Bobby Heaney walked out and then he was like, next. And I was like, hey, no, no, I'm, I'm not here for that. I'm waiting for that little guy. Yes. And he was just like, oh, why aren't you auditioning? And mm. I was, no one asked me to audition. And he mm. was like, just try, do your brother's lines. And then I went back in with Simon and we acted together. And then Bobby was like, hmm, there's something there. And then we left. Um, fast forward, I think it was Buma, six months later, I even forgot that I mm. actually auditioned. And agent is talking to mom and she's like, Salamina has been called back, blah, blah, blah. But it was actually a screen test mm. and I'd actually gotten the job and they'd struggled to find this character. And I was just like, huh, TV? What, now? Okay. Uh, and what grade were um, you in at the time? I was 13. Yeah. 14. Yeah, I was 14. Mm. So what is that? Uh, standard 7 back in our day. Standard okay, 6, so standard I was, 7. Then I was 13. So I was 5. I was in grade 8. Oh my gosh, grade 8. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, to answer your question, it almost felt like when, you know, when you scouted. Mm. So I didn't have time to plan. And I'm a person who likes to feel in control. Mm. And I make lists and I tick things off and, and, and. Because even joining this agency that we joined, it was my mom's idea. So for the longest time, even when you met me, I'd been just like, Barahuna Lu audition and, and I you rock just, up. Yes. You know, second audition ever was Soul Buddies. Third audition was crazy. Mm. So it was sort of like, Hi, I, I guess this is where God wants me to be. Yes. And the whole time I'm shy. I'm, I'm the kid my parents didn't think would make it onto TV. Mm. So I, I, it always felt like I was catching up with life. Does yes. that make sense? Yes. Um, so yes, it was almost a response of we think you must and that's what I was doing. But I almost feel like the likelihood is that's what you would have needed because if it was a conversation of let's do this, you would have overthought it and probably bombed that audition. I would have talked myself out of it <laughs> completely because like, why am I here? Yes. <laughs> when, when I had conversations with uh, Mr. Bobby Heaney, <laughs> the man who started it all, he said to me, you were such a natural fit that I went back to Soul City. Soul City was in charge of you know, they were, I guess, the people who created a younger Soul City, mm. and that's what Soul Buddies was. Mm. And the, initially, the character was uh, a Zulu girl from KZN, from like Mlazi. Mm. And the character was supposed to be called Lizeka. Mm. That's why it was so funny because my brother on Soul Buddies was Sihe Manhu. He's very Zulu boy. Um, and for the longest time, there was this. And Bobby was just like, it's fine. We'll, we'll say she work. grew up with <laughs> yes. other parents in Limpopo. He grew up with other side of the family in KZN, brother and sister. Let's go. This is the girl for the job. And isn't it amazing that you got exposed to knowing that when producers want you, they will make it happen. There's nothing that's going to stop anybody from having you have the job. If there they are productions that will delay a broadcast date for talent if they want you? You know, I think that's relative. I, yeah, I think as an independent Look, it producer. it can happen. Yes. I mean, we know within the context of clients and things like uh -huh. that. But I think the point I'm trying to make is when somebody does believe in you as, as much as they do, they will move mountains there is a to fight. make it ha happen for yeah. you. Because even if they're like, we couldn't get this one, Best believe their writing team will be starting to write something for you to come into that world. That's true. So I, I think even um, our stance to get into the producing side, we only ever thought as independent producers because we understood that when you're not an independent producer, there's still some power that you report to. And that was tricky because we knew that as performers, that's Stefina and myself. Mm. And yeah, even getting into business, that's... 
Oh, it so, was in response yes, to, to the industry. So if we go back, mm-hmm. um, you know, when you are, were just an academic kid at school, um, the one aspect of your life was measured by the red pen on the paper. Mm-hmm. Now there's this other aspect of your life that comes into play. How did what you believe failure is adjust to now doing this thing which, oh, it's fun, but then there's days where director's like, no, that, that's not how I want it. Like, what was your understanding of what failing looked like? You know, Lebo, because I started at such a, a young age, so much of what my life was about was decided by other people. Mm. One of the things that... Um, Soul City and our producers did with us on Soul Buddies is we had this incredible pressure of you are not allowed to fail. Mm. But we were on set 12 hours a day shooting Mm. Mm. on location, Mm. the elements, everything. Then we had tutors who were also on set. Well, one tutor really who had to run around and go to all our different schools, myself, Sikhle, Tsolo, we were all in high school. The others were still in primary school. Mm. It was a mad balance, right? And then we still had to do homework, still submit deadlines, da-da-da-da, write tests. Sometimes we were writing tests, but you know from being on set mm. is we were shooting in Hillbro, we in a park. Yes. I'm trying to write a test and then you have people walking past, eh, Zandi! <laughs> <laughs> now, go ahead, I'm doing trigonometry. Yes. Um, so it was all of that. Um, so we developed a very unhealthy relationship with failure because then you mm. fear it so much. There was this incredible pressure of, you are on TV, you're a role model. That word scares me to this day because mm. we heard it so much as kids. No, what do you mean? You dropped mm. your maths mark. You're a role model. Yes. Um, and especially because of the type of stories and the yeah, issues that were being addressed. It's edutainment, addressed. right? Um, yes. So we're doing positive educational content, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's difficult to answer that question because we were just not allowed to fail. That's what it felt like. And we were told you will lose your acting contract if Mm. your marks drop. Mm. So now you are constantly doing this. And then on set, you must bring it. We're not fluffing. You can't. There's no time. We're losing light. All Mm. of those normal things that come into play. Mm. So I I think I always, um, I I sigh deeply when we talk about kid stars because growing up as a child on TV is incredibly hard. Now, Sal, as we call you, (laughs) Um, I'm thinking about this thing of not being allowed to fail. And I almost feel like, and I was just thinking about it as you were speaking, not being, not being allowed to fail is actually not being allowed to live. You know what I mean? Because that's what living is, is trial and error. Mm -hmm. Now to go back to that thing of me being like, she's got her life together, right? (laughs) And how there are these other elements that people aren't aware of. So now mm. crazy comes into the picture. Do you remember? Oh my God. <laughs> the prison letters we used to get <gasps> from prisoners. Yes. <gasps> so when we were kids, TV pro, like it's so even creepy thinking about it now. We were kids, mm. we were children, we were teenagers, mm-hmm. and we would get handwritten love letters from grown men serving time in prison. And as an adult, you think about the fact that those letters get read before they get sent out. Because back in the day, at the end of the show, they'd say P.O. Box, blah, blah, blah. And the letters would come to Red Pepper. And some of them would even have glitter and like (laughs) art. How was that even okay? So that's the other layer of grown (laughs) men in prison for who knows what, murder, rape, telling you that they love you. I think it's it's difficult for people to even fathom because we were doing this at a time where we didn't have camera phones and things were not as instant. So it's the letters, it was everything like newspaper, the mm. printing, the stories and all of that, you know. And as you were saying about the prisoners, you reminded me of something else that then also happened. We had people writing in and complaining about our weight. 
My gosh! Do you remember? Do you know <laughs> that when I was presenting back chat, they made me stand in front of a podium because of my weight? Do you know that? My goodness. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's like a, yeah, a pervasive sort of foundational layer of there's somebody always watching and you just need to toe the line. Look, it still happens on air. I'm busy told now, being told now that I'm being paid to talk English, so I must talk English. When I want to respond, it's it speak, but anyways, yeah. it, it continues. Yeah. So to come back to why does that make the concept of failure 10 times more difficult, especially if you're a developing kid yeah. to now becoming an adult? I think it... It, 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 it certainly delays the process of you getting to know yourself, your true mm. self. And I think media is like that. Um, and that's why this, this landscape is so tricky. Um, because it's really difficult to shut out the noise. Mm. If we're struggling with it as adults, can you imagine being 14 and coming to work and they say, listen, um, we're changing the way you dress because... You've lost so much weight. You're so skinny. We're getting mm. complaints that you guys are anorexic. Mm. And at the time, it was so funny because it was me, Stefina, and Ketty where we were the crazy girls. And it was netball season. Mm. So it's a lot of cardio, right? And we were kids, man. You know, your body is developing. You're losing weight. You're gaining weight. Mm. Every day is a new thing. Skin problems. All of these crazy things that happen in your teens. And all of it is happening in the public eye. Mm. So it does one of two things, right? It, it either helps you develop a really thick skin mm. where you're just hardahat. I've always loved that Afrikaans word, mm. hardahat. Or you do what I did. Mm. And I found myself stuck for so many years in this good girl conditioning space <gasps> where I was like... <sighs> Ah. I will gain the weight when they want it. I will lose it when they want it. And I will be an A student. And I mean, I was the first blackhead girl at Midrand High. Yes. We're school, Midrand High. Yes. And it was so funny because even the conversation I had with the principal, the first thing he said, he said, congratulations, Salamina. You are now the black hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you understand what that means. And I was like... <gasps> I don't really want to. That's you. It's like calling me Winnie Mandela for students. <laughs> and I wasn't ready. No one prepared me for that. So even stepping into a leadership role, there was also just that expectation of if you're the first black person to do something, mm. you carry the hopes and dreams of your whole lineage. And I was just like, hey, my ancestors were not prefects. Ah. Among Hanyani. <laughs> and isn't it crazy because this is the part, hence, hence I often say that the part about celebrating being the first woman, the first black, it is so bittersweet. Like, mm. okay, great. We f but it's also 2023. Why is it taking so long? Also like so much pressure. Yeah. And it goes back to the thing of you can't fail. That's so if you're going to continue this TV thing, if you're going to continue this other thing, you better be exceptional. And you still want to play net, but you better be yeah. exceptional and, and all those things. But I very specifically remember one of the first moments where we had a very real moment. So mm -hmm. I saw you as this person and we worked together until we had a moment where we were just speaking about our struggles. Yeah. Right. And I was like, oh, she really like me, yeah. you know. And at that time, the reason it was so critical for me is because up until that point, I was always working with um, um, actors and cast that were much older than me. Mm -hmm. And they would say things like, oh, you're still young. Yeah. You won't yeah. understand. You know, they would have that thing. <laughs> yes. Right. And, you know, you know what? It, it was the first time I could relate with someone my age and mm -hmm. I remember at that time it was also connecting with Baba Lomoloi mm -hmm. and it was very very critical the conversations of understanding what it means to be a kid star yeah. while you're developing and growing learning from one another about what should we be doing with our money mm -hmm. how are we earning 
this money. Mm-hmm. Did you buy your car cash? Okay, you st- I remember you were staying in Victory Park. Mm-hmm. And I even remember you telling me how much rent you were paying. Yes. <laughs> you know, I've <laughs> always been about being very honest. Because that's the only way that we create spaces for each other to breathe. Otherwise, you're sitting in your corner, either completely debilitated by anxiety mm. or feeling like you're failing or not understanding. Or, no, 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 no. The reason Salamina can buy a car in matric is because her mom said, we're not touching your money. Mm. But for somebody like my business partner who was paying her own school fees, da, 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 mm. da, da, da. Those realities are so different. So I don't like to keep people in that, oh, she's so perfect. I'm always like, ah, oh, 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 come mm. sit down, let's talk. I like to debunk it. And I do it also. And over the years, I d- I've done it more and more. It's also to give myself a break. I don't want to be on a pedestal. And mm. I think it's important that we stop forcing this it girl thing because mm. I just want to have real experiences with real people because I'm a real person mm. and I want to be allowed the space to breathe and just go, whew, today mm. is a struggle and that's okay because tomorrow might be better. And it has also just allowed me to go, Ay, okay, it's, it's all right. I'm doing enough with what I have. And not just that you are enough, but on exactly. that note, yeah, when we come back, from the news, we continue. So many th- light bulbs are going off in my head in this conversation. It is so, so deep. It's just after 2.30. I hate to use the word child star, but that's you all know what we mean when we say child star. Also a producer and somebody I'm very proud to call a friend. And we, we were just reminiscing and we, we take your calls on 11 883 702 and the WhatsApp line 072 702 I remember your... The day you told me you had a stroke. Yeah. And it's just, sorry, I'll only your, let me not get teary. <laughs> only now I'm having a full circle moment of realizing um, you were one of, you were my first friend to have a stroke. Mm-hmm. And being younger, not really understanding the gravity. I remember the focus was just on the shock that you were so young. And I remember, obviously, we had conversations around the entire context of what was happening in your life. Mm. And then I spoke to Lira here about her mm-hmm. stroke, but now I was much more educated yes. and up to speed with what that meant. Yeah. So now, being the adult that you are, knowing that you survived a stroke at 30. Just before 30. Just, how? Yeah. And I think that also really informed entrepreneurship, starting my own thing. Um, as imperfect as that was, because when I was having my stroke, I was on set mm. and on a soapy. We all know the long hours, blah, 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 blah. But it's also that, that feeling of it's not about you. So you can't be that cog in the wheel that keeps this wheel from going forward. Mm. And it took the crew being the ones to put tools down literally the two boom swingers Mm. who do the sound they just put their booms down and the floor manager just went no Mm. we're not doing this Um, because it was happening live Mm. and then after that I don't really remember I was taken off set and 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 what had happened during lunch is it started then Mm. and I told the makeup artist who told the producer and the producer took me to a doctor who just said, I pinched myself, she must go back to work. And that's Mm -hmm. what I did. And that feeling of helplessness and and also just, I still felt like I was disappointing people, like I'm doing something wrong. But they were gaslighting you now that we we know the the, the name, the the word of what, what was happening to you. You know, fast forward, Hospital happens, da 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 da, and mine was a minor stroke, mm. right? And I'll always think of it as a warning for hmm? the something beat. is off here. Mm. Something is off here, because straight after that, it took probably another three months of just trying to get back to myself. I was lucky I didn't have like the speech impediment, all of the things that happen. The paralysis. The paralysis. Well, the paralysis was happening that, but it's almost like a, 
mine was TIA. That's what they mm. called it. Um, and and I took it as a warning, but also, literally, um, this was a Wednesday. Mm. On Saturday, my husband gets a call. Is Salamina coming back to work on Monday? What are wow. you expecting us to do? Must we write her out? Wow. And I said, I, I'm still in hospital at the time. <gasps> so there was just a lot of, oh man, I have broken myself for this industry and literally broken my body. Um, and I am here. And actually, wow, is this what 20 plus years looks mm. like? Um, you know, a health scare is almost a very spiritual thing um, because it happens and your whole life comes to a standstill. Mm. But straight after I left, the show could go on without me. Funniest thing, I remember when we were young, um, a few years back on backstage, um, one, <laughs> one of our producers said, <laughs> the only excuse you have for not coming to work is death. Yeah. Not the death of a parent, not the death of a grandmother, <laughs> your own. And I was like, ah! Oh. And that's the ugly side of the industry that people don't understand. Do you know what? I mean, the laugh we're having is not like laugh, this is so funny. Yeah. It's laugh, this is so sad. Um, I mean, it was a similar conversation when I was in the soapy world. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, a very close friend had died. Mm. And um, I don't know what in me that said, you know, and they said, but you've got eight scenes tomorrow. And I said, well, good luck with your shoot. Yeah. You know, I actually wasn't coming for permission. I was coming to tell you that, that I'm not going I'm, to be here. I, I and they can't. made it, they implied that if it was a parent, we'd say yes. And I was like, listen, now I'm still a person outside of the space. So good luck to y'all. And I said that being prepared to lose job. my job. Yeah. Not because we are rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at some point, <laughs> you just have to honor the emotional struggle, the journey, whatever it is that you need to go through. Um, and for me, I just remember that experience being that uh, Steph and I had a very sobering conversation and we said, perhaps it is possible to mm. build the kind of company where we will never put people through this. It's not mm. easy to do that and even to stick to that because it is true, the show must go on. But what we've been able to do in the eight years of entrepreneurship and we were deliberate to stay as independent producers because we didn't ever want to get to the point where we couldn't say, cut, cut, cut. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I also, I, I am, I'm empathetic to producers who have to deliver episodes at the end mm. of the day. The broadcaster has a TX date, guys. So I'm not criticizing mm. It's just, it's that tricky thing of where does humanity come in, in this Let game? me tell you what I would criticize if, if we're going to be real, producer to producer mm -hmm. and having, us having gone through all those experiences yeah. and the many that we will never say publicly True. because yeah. it is that deep yeah. and it will hurt people. Yes. Is not so much the fact that the show must go on, but it's how things were handled. Exactly the types of conversations, yes. how you did an act to know that, look, channels deciding yeah. that this is the end of the road for you. How can we support you? Yeah. That's what the issue is. Bought. Yes. And that's really what we wanted at the very foundation of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why a lot of people ask us, you know, the, the, the thing with being independent producers is like being an independent musician where you're selling CDs out of your boot. And, 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 and Salamina's no boot, guys, is a Bentley. <laughs> man. That's, what being a, <laughs> that's what being an enterprise <laughs> joking is Right. <laughs> it's the Uber guy <laughs> who you're pretending <laughs> is your driver. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when he has to take himself offline, actually, to just take you to auditions. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, we're laughing. I think it's the very dark sense of humor within us. <laughs> oh my gosh, Salamina Moses, I'm such a fan from back in your days. It's crazy. And of course, as Zandu on Soul Buddies. Oh my gosh. And then eventually Seven Delan and then your own production company. I think it's Sorel. Yeah. But wow. I mean, I remember when... I ended up working at Red Pepper Pictures and I, at some point, and then I was like, oh my gosh, Salamina used to work here. You know, you you were, you actually made most of our childhoods and oh. we as fans are very proud of you. This is Wole Bukheng from Ranfintin. Good day, Wole Bukhile and Salamina. I really wish to commend Salamina for writing a children's book. You know, all of us grew up with no book, uh, seeing people like us. And this is going to also make uh, the little ones be interested, be eager to read and to be read to. And that is going to make a huge difference considering right now we have been told that South Africa uh, literacy and uh, reading we are below par so mm. i just want to say bravo to her thanks dima you know salamina to me when i was growing up looked like a very disciplined uh, uh, a daughter very disciplined uh, uh, <laughs> a young lady uh, she's around my age i'm just one year older but uh, you know that, that these are the type of uh, ladies that you see when you grow up, you'll think I would wanna date or marry somebody like Salamina, like so down to earth, a respectful, disciplined, like she's so wonderful. Wow. Uh, you know, growing up watching Usal on television, we always think that people are having a good life, that life is easy, you know, that they've got it all together. Having heard this interview, I ship. I know. <laughs> I, I I respect her for having come through this and being a stronger person. Uh, I don't know whether to call this failure or lesson, but she's not starting from zero. She's starting from experience. Mm, well yes. done, this and a great show. Oh, wow. And some of the WhatsApp messages, a big congratulations to Salamina for everything happening in her life. Super proud of you, friend, and love you big time. We can't wait for the next movie and book. Not forgetting the blog stories. That one is unsigned. Another one says to Salamina, thank you for making our name cool. I grew up hating that name because I was teased. Finally, you were on crazy. Thanks, God. You were on TV. Hello. <laughs> Love you lots with hubby. Another one says, showcasing both your voiceover work as well. Back to back. Love the show always. Good afternoon. Sabelo from Rockville. Hi, Lewa and Salamina. Wow, I'm so happy that you're having her on 702 today. I loved her back then and I still love her even today. My hero, may God continue to be on your side. That is from Cabo. How do you feel hearing all of those oh, you know, messages and that feedback? Sure. Um, I'm so grateful. I'm, wow, I'm, and emotional now. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's always a wonderful thing when people mm. can just when people respond to what we do, mm. um, I think as creatives, a lot of the time we create in isolation and sometimes it's lonely, right? The, the hardest thing is when we have to share those creations. Um, one of the voice notes spoke about my children's book, Disaster at Gogos Paza. I was writing that in a pit of depression. Mm. I had just given birth. It was locked down. And I felt that panic of, <gasps> if mm. we're not working, we're not earning, mm. right? And my big panic is always, <gasps> yeah. what's my next thing? What's my next thing? What's my next thing? Um, you know, a lot of people will talk about, oh, you know, I, and then I pivoted and I pivoted and I mm. pivoted. And I listened to a lot of TED Talks and all of this because that's the space we live in, right? So I was writing this book and, you know, <clears throat> you've put the baby down. I'm breastfeeding. I have a 10-year-old at the time. She's in homeschooling. Mm. I feel like I'm failing at that. I'm not a teacher. I'm a chica. She's scared mm. of me. Now mommy is like a monster teacher and all of that. Yes. And in the back of my mind, I'm also like, 
I must bring my own, you know, my husband is in the arts, guys. Mm. You know, it's a very real conversation of, oh, oh, are we losing this house? Mm. And and these are the things that are not nice to talk about. And right. You and, know, and it's just unpopular because then it's like, why listen to Chile? Without understanding our industry, it's like we're freelance workers and you mm. go from contract to contract. And sometimes you have good seasons. And sometimes you have a very dry season. But when you're a parent and you've got responsibilities, da 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 all of this just comes. So back to the book, I'm mm. writing it at a time and I'm like, you know, I'm going to try something new. I've always known I'm going to write a book, but I don't know how to do it. So I always, I love studying. I love to feel like I've backed myself up. So I was mm. doing a short writing course and this book wasn't meant to be published. It was, I was turning in a chapter mm. um, with each module that I was doing. And there were 10 modules. And at the end, I had 10 chapters. And then the last email from the lecturer was, well, now put it all together and let's see if a book came out of this experience. Mm. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And that's your final assignment. She graded it and she sent me an email with contacts for a publisher. And she said, this is the most delightful assignment I've ever read. Oh. Try and get it published. And that's how that book happened. So it was, you know, I had to pull and push and pull my hair out and, 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 and. Mm. I'm glad something good came out of it. I've always been an avid reader and somebody who advocates for mm. children loving to read, not doing it, but they must love to do mm. it. And there's a way that we can activate. And I think that also comes from all my time in children's broadcasting. Yes. Just yes. sort of trying to think like a child and then trying to think what would make them want to open this book. And I, it was interesting. I almost feel like you are already engaging the inner child. But as we, as we close up the conversation, I know we could touch on being a small business, mm. owing crew money, owing government money, mm. um, um, looking like a success on the outside, yeah. knowing like you don't know what's going to happen next. But what I really want to touch on, because it's so, so critical, you have come out of so many bounds of really difficult moments of depression, postpartum depression. How have you managed to not see yourself as a failure going through those things where intellectually you know it's not your fault, mm -hmm. but in real life, not being able to play with your child the way they need you to, yeah, not being able to do that presentation as well as you could, not being able to get out of bed. Yeah. I think... So many people need to hear from someone who has lived it and lives it. And I mean, I've learned so much having those conversations with you over pancakes. Yeah. Lidi kuku, discons. You know, um, I think it's, 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 it's a very up and down journey. Mm. Um, and I speak openly about it because I want people to understand that just because I'm married to a great guy and we're in a healthy relationship. And he's so great, he can is. I just he say. Really he really is. He really is. You know, it's it can still happen to you mm. that you're struggling with your your mental health. Um, and for me, it's 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 a combination of learning to set boundaries. It's dispelling this myth of I have to have it all together and and consciously just learning to ask for help. It's mm reading stuff it's um you know curating the content i consume it's mm. it's um having honest conversations even with the kids mm. um and that that was hard at the beginning because i used to cry in private and then come out and mommy is like oh, i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine and then there was just a day where do me just said to me and she was like seven mm. and she said mommy i heard you crying and she's crying. And she said, why are you crying? Did I do? And I was like, well, stop the lorry, mm. stop the pass. I didn't want her to internalize and then do the people pleasing thing that I had learned to do mm. my whole childhood just to make mommy smile. And I said to her, you never have to perform for me. Um, this is what mommy is struggling with. And that helped us even as parents who've both struggled with depression. Tsepo has a chronic illness. That's our mm. every day. And there's ups and downs that happen sometimes even daily with moods and and emotions and 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 so 
it's it's just having open, honest conversations as black and brown people and 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 stopping this thing of shaming or feeling ashamed for not feeling okay. Um, and and just allowing ourselves room to breathe. It's like a balloon, you know. If if you just keep blowing it up, oh, eventually we all know the pop is gonna come. I did that to myself, so now I I'm very conscious to ooh, and watch and build a good support system around you. That's the that's my saving grace. Listen, you and I could do a seven hour broadcast yes, we of could. this conversation. <laughs> I love you. I adore you. Thank you. And I continue to look up to you. Please keep being you. Thank, Thank you for you having so much. me. Thank you. 702. The upside of failure. Sometimes failure is the foundation of greatest success stories.